The Lord be with you. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. And Jesus returned in power. Power is a good thing. Electrical power is a good thing. Electrical power, it's been said, is a little bit like oxygen. You only think about it when you don't have it. When you only think about it when it doesn't work the way you expect it to work. We had a power outage in our neighborhood several last week. We had a resurgence of that and a little bit of the power surge fried a circuit board on our refrigerator so it doesn't work. So now we've got a nice shiny storage box in our refrigerator we can use for something. We only think about electrical power when it isn't there. When there's an outage, when something is a show of hands, am I the only person who, if the power goes out in your home, walks into a dark room and does this? <laughs> right? You know, we're trying to flip the switch like that's going to do something because it's natural. We've grown up with it. We understand that. Electrical power is natural, it's normal. We expect it, at least, in our lives. We use it for heating, we use it for cooling to cook our food, to entertain us with televisions and computers. It charges all of our mobile communications devices that we use to stay in touch with people. For some of you, it even powers your cars. Without electrical power, life as we know it comes to an end, and we're living in some sort of post-apocalyptic science fiction movie. The thing we use in modern industrial society to get electrical power from where it is created to the circuit boards in our refrigerators is called the power grid, every aspect of it. The grids, for there are multiple here in the United States, are comprised of a lot of different parts. There are generating plants, transmission lines, substations, transformers, distribution lines, consumers. I like to say transducers just to see if anybody's paying attention. There's almost half a million miles of high voltage power lines in the country. More than 160,000 miles of overhead transmission lines. Maybe you live in one of the areas just to the west of us on Poplar Pike, Park Avenue, down on Winchester, you drive past these metal monsters that stand in the fields. So often you don't even recognize them or pay attention. They are just normal. They're part of our environment. And they carry the lines that carry the power that go to your home. We cannot store in large quantities any usable form of electrical power. We have to be able to produce it rapidly, get it to where it is needed quickly, constantly generating, constantly renewing. A power grid has to be constantly evolving so that although we might have a power outage in 2019, it will not be as bad as what we had in 2003 or 1977 or 1965 as we repair, maintain, develop, allow it to be evolving the power grid might also be useful as an image for unpacking today's scriptures, if we would like. We recognize, first of all, there has to be a source of the power. That could begin in our world with fossil fuels or the water at Boulder Dam or the TVA sources the wind farms out west or solar panels. But the fossil fuels have to be released. The water has to be channeled. The wind and the solar rays have got to be collected, channeled, directed. Power is just out there, free, but not useful for us until it is organized and directed. You've heard before, you'll hear again, that the power that is released by 10 gallons of gasoline in an automobile will take you from Germantown to Jackson, Tennessee, maybe to Nashville. But that same 10 gallons of gasoline, having all of its power released at once, becomes an improvised explosive device, wreaking havoc, taking lives, causing chaos. Power has to be channeled. 
released in a way that we can use so that we are not overcome. The ultimate source, the origin of all power, of our power, our lives and our spirits is the divine. God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, one source of all of our power. God is limitless. We are incredibly limited. God is infinite. We are very time bound. So out of love for us, sons and daughters of God, created in the image and likeness of God, God chooses by God's own free will to channel God's power so that we might enjoy its benefits and grow and be renewed. God chooses to channel the Spirit for our life, our inspiration, our recreation. God chooses. God chooses a people as one of the first parts of God's power grid. God chooses a people to be a blessing for all people. That's one of the first promises that you hear God speaking to Abraham. Through you, all people will be blessed with the blessings that I give to you. God works through this so that all the world might know God's gifts. And God allows those of our ancestors who encounter God to record those encounters, to collect them in love stories, in histories, in genealogies, in conversations, in arguments, and to put them together in a form and a fashion that is absolutely unheard of outside of Israel. A collection that we call the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. The idea that the divine will might be collected and recorded for the benefit of all ages is something that is radically new. And somebody in the back is saying, but wait a minute, what about the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh? We studied that in the ninth grade. Yes, there are a few odd sagas that float around. And they are pale, pale watercolors, dim echoes of the incredible power that God allows to be encompassed in and channeled through the scriptures. The wild, free power of the Spirit works in a way that we can understand as we read the words and encounter again a way that we make sense of our encounters with God. Unique. New. God's love, God's grace, God's intentions for us recorded, collected, that we might live with them. Next step of this power grid that God is creating is to form this people as a people, a family of faith, a community of the Spirit. And people, being people, begin to forget. And we begin to think that we're being formed not to be a family, not to be a community, but a nation like the other nations, an empire like the other empires. That's understandable. We always want to look like the cool kids who are around us. And so we try to create a nation that is an empire with all of the pain that follows with that. Expansion, oppression, collapse, war, exile. And that's the backstory to Nehemiah's text this morning. Nehemiah. Don't think I didn't hear all of your eyes collectively rolling back into your heads when Ed said, and we're going to read from the book of Nehemiah to you. The people have been exiled and they are returned. They're in Jerusalem and they're trying to build it back. All of their hopes of being a great empire like the other nations of the earth, had been crushed when the armies came from the east and the walls were destroyed and the temple was burned and looted and the people were captivated and carted off to be slaves in Babylon. And now they've returned and they're rebuilding the temple and they're rebuilding the walls and they're trying to create themselves as a country again. But to what purpose? 
To what end? And they find it again in the books of the law, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Torah. And Nehemiah and Ezra gather the people together. It says all the people who can hear, men and women and children, and they're all brought into one place. And they read all of these Scriptures, all five of the books at the very least. And at the end of it, the people are crying. Some of them weeping, I'm sure, with sorrow at what has been lost. I'm equally sure that some are weeping with joy as they've heard again about God's love and God's grace and God's walk with us. And the preacher tells them, I understand why you might be crying, but today is not a day for tears. Today is a day for rejoicing. Because today the power has been reconnected. Today the power is restored from God our source through the channels of Scripture and here in worship and we have received it. So go, eat the best food you've got, drink the best wine you've got, share with others who don't have because today the power has been turned back on and the light has broken the darkness and we can see and all will be good. And they are loved. Not as some passing nation of the world, but as a family of faith, a community of God's Spirit. The power grid takes shape, and we have the stories, and we have the writings, and we have the worship, the collective worship that we engage in. And that's why Jesus' first act in his public ministry is to take place in worship. Worship becomes understood as a place where the scriptures are read and unpacked, where we sing psalms and where we pray prayers and we share one another's joys and concerns. You can go to most any synagogue worship and you'll feel comfortable there. You'll understand what happens. It's a lot like what we do here. I'm not saying that Private devotions and meditation and contemplation don't matter, they do. But collective worship, what we do here on Sunday morning, is where we hear our collective story of creation and fall and redemption and flood and exile and exodus and restoration and renewal. And Jesus, full of power, returns from the desert to his home in Nazareth. He's not somebody who goes up without knowing what to do. He understands. He's experienced it. He goes to worship regularly. He's not the first century A.D. equivalent of a CME. Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. He's in worship all the time. And the scroll is given, as it would be. You don't necessarily have a trained rabbi. What you have are people who know the scriptures, who spent time with that and God and worship, and they read and they unpack, and the scriptures are given, and Jesus chooses his passage to read from the book of the prophet Isaiah, this passage of hope and of the coming reign of God on earth, that the spirit of the Lord descends, that the poor have good news, that the acceptable year of the Lord is proclaimed, that the blind see and the captive are released and the oppressed are set free and we know this scripture this is powerful for us and what will Jesus do with it how will he handle this which is sometimes difficult because there are still the blind and still the captive and still the poor he could take a familiar preacher's approach and talk about how great it was back when Isaiah was around you know, when Isaiah was here, giants roamed the earth. They were such spiritual wonders. And we can learn from them, and we can be like them, and we can look back there. Wasn't life great then? But as the wit said, nostalgia ain't what it used to be. And we quickly get tired of looking back. So he might have taken another trick and talked about what's going to happen in the future. When we get to the point where we are good enough for this, when we get to the spot where we are cleaned up enough for this, when we get to the point where we are respectable enough, this is what God is going to do. It's like Lewis Carroll in Alice in Wonderland, right? Jam yesterday, jam tomorrow, but never jam today. 
or as the restaurant in East Memphis over on Quince Road has painted on the outside of their wall, free hamburgers tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. But Jesus comes today. And Jesus comes in power today. And Jesus releases power today. Because what good is power if it is not released? What good is power if it is kept in the generator? What good is power if it is not used? What good is power if it never turns on the lights in your house? Never is used to cook a meal? Never is used to entertain or inform you? Then it goes to waste. And God wastes nothing. And Jesus wastes nothing. And the power of God is released through the collective worship and the hearing of the Scripture. And Jesus starts His public ministry by claiming that power is given through this generator to all the people who need it. And who are they? Well, if there's one thing that all the people referenced in this passage from Isaiah and Luke have in common, it is this. They are not the powerful people in the world. Jesus brings good news to the poor, to the captive, to the blind, to the oppressed. These aren't the people we aspire to become. These are the people we feel pity for as we pass them and as we decide how we may assist them. But Jesus says he comes for them as he begins his public ministry. In the past, when Isaiah was with us, in the future, when we've cleaned up enough, Jesus says today the blind will see. Today the poor will have the good news preached to them. Today is the favorable time of the Lord which you can read about, but it means that the economy is going to be structured so that all people have something that they need. It's that debts are going to be forgiven, that land is going to be restored to the ancestors. Where is the good news in that for me? Or for us who are secure? For we who are secure? I've worn eyeglasses since the seventh grade, but I'm not blind. I've never been in jail and unable to post bond. And while our political system might need some reform, I am not unduly oppressed. So where is the good news for us in Jesus' first ministry? I ask you to consider it like this. When you see a house on fire in your neighborhood, you call the fire department to put out the fire in that house. You are not saying that your home is not important. You are not saying where you live does not matter. You are not saying that the domicile that you have taken care of is insignificant. What you are saying is there is a problem in our neighborhood and we need to fix the problem. We need to address the situation that is at risk unless it encompass all of us. Jesus is doing something similar. Filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, He lifts up all of those who are not enjoying the benefits of God's redeemed world. And He challenges by doing that our notions of power. Because we have plenty of voices that will say power is seen as you advance your own agenda, as you promote your own achievements, your own accomplishments. But the power of the Holy Spirit is seen as it is extended for the benefit of others. The power of the Holy Spirit is seen when it sets others free, when it builds others up, when it is used for the betterment of all of those around us. Where then is the Holy Spirit for us and the good news? God loves you so much that God offers you power to show the grace that you have received to everyone else. God desires your spiritual growth so much that God is willing to give you access to all the power you need. You, not me, not Tim, not Aaron, not any other religious professional, but you, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to see that the oppressed are released, 
to see that the captives are freed, that those who are in need receive what they need because God loves you so much and desires your growth so deeply that God gives you all the power you need to let the grace you've been given be seen, be felt, until this day we are one step closer to Eden. What a gift. What a challenge. What a God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.